Welcome to the Social Lights podcast with Kate Vandervoort, where I interview changemakers and innovators on how they connect with their tribe on social media. Brought to you by Social Mediology. Welcome everyone to episode 51 of the Social Lights podcast. I am here today with Ian Moyce, who is Chief Revenue Officer at One Up Sales and a longtime sales leader. He was awarded the accolade of UK Sales Director of the Year by BESMA, which is the British Excellence in Sales Management Awards. And in 2019 and 2020, was listed in the top 50 sales keynote speakers by Top Sales World. Ian has built many large communities on social media and is a social influencer for SAP, Oracle, Huawei, Commvault and more. It is wonderful to be here with you today, Ian. Thank you and thank you for the opportunity to uh, take part. Yes, Ian's on the other side of the world to me. So Ian stayed up very late and is keen to go to bed. So we'll make this <laughs> impactful. So That's Ian, all right, don't worry. <laughs> Ian, let's get started with what is it that lights you up? What inspires to inspires you to get out of bed in the morning or stay up late at night, as the case may be? Um, it's a variety of things, really. It, I mean, it, it, being in the role I'm in, whether it's, you know, it, it is sales, regardless it, regardless of it's sales leadership, and I've managed and built many teams. It is sales, right? And I'm proud of that fact. And people shy away from labelling themselves as in sales. And I talk often about that and take part in a number of communities that engage with, you know, sales is a profession. And sales is about engaging with people. It's about, you know, engaging with people at all different uh, times of the cycle. It isn't always that they're going to buy from you. It's about building rapport and relationship with people, sometimes where you have a solution or service that may be applicable to do good for them and sometimes when it's not but you're still engaging with them you still go through a process even if, if you may qualify out or they mutually qualify out so it, it's about that and, and through that it's probably where we'll talk about with community uh, for your listeners it I've ended up getting involved in social media as a byproduct of that as social media entered our lives I guess coming probably about 15 years ago now, it, it, it's lengthening its life cycle, but it's not been around that long in reality, but it has had a major impact on changing how people engage and how people get their information and, uh, and, and how communities and tribes uh, are built and find each other. As, as, as we are talking here, right? How would we have found each other for social media and this type of technology to do what we're doing right now and talking. Yeah, that's right. So thinking back to pre-social media days, tell us a bit about your journey um, before launching One Up Sales. Where have you come from? Yeah, so pre pre-social media days, I was running sales teams in the technology sector and um, old tech, right, where it was very much the old school of you would speak to someone and get to talk to them. And they would ask you, what, what do you do? Tell us about your company, your product and yourself, because they didn't know. So you had that opportunity to set the scene and your personal brand was, was that. It was whatever you represented in person in, in that encompass. So personal brand um, in, in its term has been around pre-social media. It's not a social media thing. It's just got that moniker, that label um, really, in the, in the modern day, people understand more about personal branding um, and social influence and all this type of stuff. It was around before, but it, you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it with the extensive scale and reach that you can achieve now in the way you can. If you wanted to re a, a create a personal brand on a global basis, then very few could achieve it. And it was a celebrity type thing or, a, a, you know, it was of that escalation and cost a lot of money. Now, as I sort of contribute and prove in, in my sphere, you can do it on a shoestring if you have expertise and you have a willingness to do so, you can make an impact and, and, and achieve a reach in your particular sector or area of expertise globally. Well, and it used to be we said things like our rep your reputation precedes you. <laughs> you know, it was word of mouth a lot of it, wasn't it? The the building personal brand was very much about reputation and how people talked about you. And now, as you say, that happens on 
on steroids. So why did you start One Up Sales? What was the need or the the gap that you saw that needed needed filling there? Well, what One Up Sales? We, what we do at One Up Sales, and I I didn't start the company, but I I've joined I've joined many startups, smaller firms, and helped them grow and accelerate through to exit. And One Up Sales, what what we do is we help people gamify the engagement they have with people. So in, within businesses, we help them to use the data that they already have and turn it into insights and, and engagement. And what I'm doing is using my personal brand. Wherever I've worked in these organizations, one of my, the values I bring to them is the personal brand and reach that I have and how I can leverage that to help the, as a byproduct to help grow the business through techniques such as social selling um, and appearing on things such as this. Right? So one of the things um, and all the things I get involved in, I get invited to blog, podcast, panel interviews. I did a panel this, uh, this morning in UK time. And through doing so, the brand of the organization, to a degree, rides on the back of the opportunity that comes off of my personal brand. So you can see, you know, on the, for those on video behind me, I've got our logo. We've just spoken about our company name. Uh, and that's off the back of things that I've done pre to the company. So your personal brand, this is where I think it's important as an individual, it's yours. It goes with you from organization to organization and it in increases the intrinsic value as you as an individual. And so at what point did you realize that your personal brand was really, because in some ways that's, that's your product, right? That's the value that you're, that you're bringing. So at what point did you, because I think often people accidentally build a personal brand. Um, at what point did it stop being accidental and you were consciously building your brand as a person, yeah. as an individual? Yeah, exactly. And that's, so how it came about was I realized in sales, sales was getting harder. And I'm sure people listening will recognize this. You know, the old techniques of marketing and engaging were having uh, less intrinsic success and results. They just were. Um, and we always hear every business, you talk to business leaders of all sizes, what's your biggest, biggest problem? Acquiring new customers, finding leads, whatever you want to call it, labor it as. Um, and it got harder for salespeople because people do their research and there's all these stats around 60 to 70% of the buying cycle is done before they engage a salesperson. Whatever the stat is you believe, it has changed. And I saw it changing. So I was trying to figure out as a sales leader, how do I stay relevant? How do we continue to be successful in whatever business I'm in when traditional early engagement, how do I get engaged with a prospect to have a conversation? Those were changing. The dynamic was changing because all of us, you, me, everyone listening as a buyer behave differently because we live in a different environment and we have the capability to behave differently. So, you know, think about how we buy things as a consumer. How many of us, particularly during COVID, bought on Amazon, right? Because it's convenient and you hear about a product or you have a problem and you go, on the, go online to search for a solution for it, right? And then when you find different solutions or options, you look at the peer reviews. What have other people said about this product? Oh, it's only got one star from 400 people. You don't know those people, right? But you take their advice. You take the tribe's advice in your buying. You're going to see a movie. You might look IMDb up, and, and as, as I do often, and, oh, that movie looks interesting. The cover of the advert, oh, my gosh, it's got 2.3 from 12,000 people. Okay, they've done good marketing job. Do I want to watch it or not? You, and you make your own decision, but you've got an influence factor on you. So we're all behaving differently because we wouldn't have done that 15 to 20 years ago. You might ask a few friends, have you seen this movie? Or uh, 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 what's that book like? Uh, did, have you read it? Or that sort of thing. But you didn't have ability 24 seven from any device. You know, you grab your mobile and in 10 seconds, you can look up and find out about virtually anything, including um, businesses that you might want to deal with products or you want your car serviced, anything, you can find options to deal with businesses and then find out about them and make your own buying decisions without any engagement with them. I'm not using them because they've got a bad reputation. They have no say in it. So based on that was happening, the selling environment, the buying environment, the, the buyer dynamic was changing. So 
I started to look at, the, it wasn't called social selling then, but how do I get involved and start with LinkedIn and then other social platforms? How do I find out about the person I want to engage with? And how do I start to get engagement with them using what's now called social triggers? And, that, and that's doing things such as looking at the content they share or post, looking at, I can learn about that prospective customer and I can engage with them. I might like their content authentically. So I don't like go and like things that aren't relevant. And I might comment or I might share an article or tag them into something that, that do you know what? They're always posting about this subject. Try and get some engagement and conversation that some way down the line turns into a real world conversation. And we're back into a normal sales process of quantifying, qualifying, if there might be a, a reason to do business together. And through that, to answer your question in a long manner, I realized what per social personal brand meant because I started to realize, well, if I'm going to start to engage with them in this way to try and get a conversation, they view back your profile often they'll view you back, right? If you do something, what's the first thing they do? Well, who's, who's, who's this guy in voice? And they look back at your profile. And if it doesn't represent you well, that's their first impression of you. Not as, as in the old days where you come in, in their office and first impressions count, right? Or the first two minutes, they make their judgment, the first five seconds, all those phrases we're used to. Um, it's not about suiting, booting and, and turning up on time and being professional and shiny shoes or a firm handshake. It's now a digital handshake. It's now a digital first impression. And it's one that you have less control over. Because if I'm coming to your, meet, your office in the years past to meet you at 10 o'clock and to talk about what we do, I've got a lot of control over that. I know when the meeting is, I can make sure at 10 o'clock that morning I look good and I've turned up on time and uh, I'm prepared and all the rest of it. I can't control when, you, when and if you're going to look at my profile and if you're going to look at my content and if you're going to look at my other profiles, if you're going to search me on Google and find other information about me. I have no control over that. You have full control as the customer to find any information you wish and make any, any pre-decision you wish. And that's where personal brand changed because it's now global, right? Anyone globally can look me up on the internet and find everything that is there about me that's publicly viewable and view it and make predetermined decisions about me. And if I'm not taking care of that and controlling it, then the decisions and the viewing will still happen. And what role does personal branding play in creating a community or a following and then I've got a follow-up question about community and how it relates to selling sure so so that's an interesting one right? because I, I run a, a number of different groups so what, one of them on LinkedIn for example has now got something like 46,000 members um, and I remember starting it purely because as I described at the beginning I'm an advocate for professional selling I just started a group in the early days because there wasn't there were some groups around but i didn't see one that was really the foremost group and started it and you know had 50 members and people were posting content and then 100 and then and as it's got more momentum it took a life of its own and often i just get 10 15 people a day just joining that group now and it continues to grow at a faster pace i've got another group on security specialization when i've worked in security and that's about nine thousand people now and the beauty of that, of course, is you now have this tribe or this community with a specialist interest and you know what they're in. Why did they join that group? Because it's about a specialist user group, right? It's got a subject. It isn't just join a group. It's about a specific subject and th that those people are interested in. So weirdly, I now get people reach out to me and what, what would it cost to, to promote a, an article in your group? Or please, can we? Would you be OK if we post this? Because it's got a profile. Um, and, you know, a part of that is off of your personal brand, your professionalism and what you stand for and represent. You start the group and you may start it with a number of other individuals as well. You can do groups with multiple moder moderators. Right. But it's got to be something you're passionate about, interested about and bring value to. Um, you know, I'm not going to go and start a group tomorrow on. Uh, 17th century archaeology because I don't know nothing about it no interest there are people out there that will be in those groups 
but they'll follow someone who is an expert in their field that's relevant to that, right? So, you know, my advice would be you don't start a group where you have no context as, as being a thought leader in that space, but you can become a thought leader by creating a group and creating content that goes with it. So it isn't just about creating the group because people join the group for the content and the learnings and the insights they get from others who join the group. So, you know, I'm lucky that I started the right group at the right time to a degree. Is it easy? Is it the case of, as in the field of dreams, build it and they will come? I don't think it is, right? It isn't just build a group and by nature of it, everyone will join because there may be a group already in, in, in formation or that's out there that has that, that forum of, of people. And why are they going to join your group unless you are offering something different? Is there a niche that isn't being addressed? a subgroup um, or specialist micro niche of, of content that might address them. But if something's already there and everyone's in it, the hardest piece is at the beginning, because why are you going to join a group when there's five people in it? And I think yeah. it's interesting because there are lots of groups that I would say potentially are not communities. And so what have you done in your groups to consciously build community? So just thinking about that connection between the members of the group, what are some of the strategies that you've used? So initially it was about creating good content that addressed that audience and then posting it into the group and then promoting it, externalizing it. So you can, for example, create a LinkedIn group um, on, on XYZ specialist subject and then write some insightful piece of content that you put out generically, post into the group, but relate the content back to the group. So anyone that finds it, you relate them back to this type of content. This is where you want to join. If you, if you read this and found it very interesting, here's a fantastic group to join where we're attracting people who will share other content like this and look for um, potentially what you can do is look for other experts or in, in your specialist field and invite them to be joint founders with you right, of the group. Doesn't cost you anything. Look, creating this, we, we should, and you make new contacts that way as well, right? So I, I specialize in the cloud technology sector, cloud computing. And through doing this and building my personal brand and creating content, I have made con increasingly contacts around the globe, the social allows you to do this, who are experts in the field who um, take part in such groups and invite me on different things that they get invited to. And I do the same. And we've created our own private sort of, of niche group where a lot of us are, are influencers now and we know each other. We found each other. And because of the content we were sharing, we've naturally attracted to each other and found each other. So, you know, I've had recently, I had one where uh, we did a panel type um, web video thing such as this and what a specialist a guy high up in microsoft joined and i didn't know him because of that i knew him because he's a social influencer and we share content and we bump into each other all the time and we liked each other's content and commented and and we it felt like we knew each other but we realized in doing this thing we'd never actually spoken before like this until we jumped on this thing and i invited him because i said to them i think this guy would be great for it and you know, and now we talk even more and we talk about doing other things together. So by creating a community and a personal brand, creating good content, it, it's, a, it's like the circle of life. You make new contacts and by making new contacts, your community gets stronger and, you know, there's nothing wrong with creating a bit of content and you share it. They share it and comment on it. Their audience sees it. You've now got access to a whole nother audience who are also interested in the same subject area. So it's a, for me, it's a culmination of, it's like the snowball. You, you, st you know, you start rolling it a little bit and other things attract and stick to it and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and it starts to roll on itself down the hill. And that's what I've experienced. You know, if you'd said to me 10 years ago, I remember then I had about two and a half thousand, three thousand contacts and followers on LinkedIn. I'm now near heading for 40,000. Um, and would never have considered being a social influencer. Didn't, you know, I thought that was the, the Kardashians type thing. So I didn't aspire as set up to do this. I just aspired to be more successful in my sales role and stay relevant. And 
created some content. And every time I created something, I started to realize the impact you can have on a global basis to now find, as you kindly mentioned at the beginning, I get invited to blog and write for IBM and Oracle and SAP and all these big brands. And that that gets me noticed and I get more followers. And because I get those followers, they look at what groups and join the groups. And so it's this domino effect that you can create, but you've got to start somewhere. And my advice would be don't expect suddenly to have a community of the 46,000, 48,000, whatever it is in my group now. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, it's taken me 10 years to get to this position where I get opportunities to me each week. I get a DM on Instagram or a DM. I had a DM on Instagram last week for a whole sales community. Do you have any quotes you can give us, Ian, that we're using of all these quotes we're putting out from people? I get a DM on Twitter. Uh, do you, could you take part in this or contribute? Could you help us with this and give us a quote for this? They come out of the blue all over the place because they've seen something I've done whether it be a podcast, whether it be a webinar, a blog I wrote, some social, so many, so I put myself out there now and volunteer for things because I realize it creates your own opportunity. The more you put yourself out and, and contribute and create content, the more this stuff will happen, but you've got to keep at it. It does not happen overnight. It's like the, the things we hear about comedians and, you know, where, where they suddenly appear and they're, they're the, let overnight success and then they say yeah i've been i've been on the circuit for 15 years it, it takes time. social, it, social it, media it is not, yeah it's notorious for making people look like the overnight success isn't it yeah <laughs> so one of the things i'm really interested in is we have a lot of brands and businesses that come to us and what they're doing on social media is implementing traditional sales techniques and strategies on these newer type platforms, which really doesn't work. And I think you were talking about earlier the concept of social selling. Um, yeah. And, you know, a lot of people try and get them offline as quickly as possible and onto the phone. And, you know, you get all that typical on LinkedIn. I believe in the power of phone calls. Can we set up a phone call? It's like, I don't even know who you are or what you're contacting yeah. me about. And I don't have all day to sit on the phone. So talk... Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that concept of social selling and how social media has changed selling for businesses, brands, companies? Sure. So firstly, social selling is a misleading term. And I've said this from the start, when it got labelled as such, social selling should be called using social media platforms to get engagement with someone that eventually you want to turn into a real world conversation as a beginning of a qualification of a sales process, but it doesn't. <laughs> Not doesn't. as catchy. <laughs> yeah. So, so because I, I often get people say, well, our product or service, you couldn't sell it over social, right? Because they have this perception of it's taking order or doing the whole sales process over social. It's not. So what is social selling? It's another tool in your kit bag um, that goes alongside everything else. And you absolutely hit the nail on the head when you said about phone calls is, I always say to people, if you can use traditional methods and, get, and phone someone or get an introduction to someone to have a conversation, do it. Because that is the most immediate way to do it. I've got a sales team and I say to them, are they just sending out stuff on social and then going that route? No, what they're doing to first is trying to get a conversation with someone. Because if they can get them on the phone, you can very quickly within a few moments quantify, can we bring value to you or is, is, is it not right? Let's qualify in or out mutually of is there a worthy of having a conversation and not wasting your time? Um, that, that's how you should do it to start with, right? It, social selling does not, is not an excuse for not picking up the phone and, de and, and trying to talk to people. What social selling, where social selling fits, in my opinion, is it works in parallel because if you try and get someone on the phone and you can't, you can't get through to anyone in this organization um, that you want to engage with, then what do you do? Do you give up? Or do you keep phoning them? Do you, do you, I've seen organizations that where, where the, the SDR, the inside salesperson is, yeah, this is my 50th call to them and I'm just keeping going. It's like, well, once you go past a certain number, do you not think it's going to get harder? Because if you've called them eight times, as an as example, and left voicemails, they're starting to recognize your number, right? And if they haven't let you through at this point, is it purely they're just going to give in and let you speak to them through persistence and 
How's that conversation going to go on call 43 when you get through? Are they not going to be, look, I know you've been trying to get hold of me, but how, how warm is that going to be? So there's a balance of, look, you're not getting through to someone. What do you do? And that's where social selling falls in. It's about engaging. It's like nurturing that marketing did, but from sales perspective, and it isn't quick. This is the problem. Sales wants instant gratification, right? I, I want to speak to you and sell to you now because I'm being told to, and I'm being told by the business, we need pipeline, we need leads. So I've, I've got to get hold of you now. So I've just got to quickly get hold of you and you've connected to me. So here comes my sales pitch in the in-mail next because I want to do it now. You know, the best social selling I've done, and I won't name them, but I've, I've managed to engage with very senior people in multi-billion dollar companies over the years through using social selling and it worked but i've got as many stories where i tried to do it and it didn't work right but if you think about it those ones i got through to i wasn't getting through to using traditional methods so in in terms of keep the traditional methods going up over here but these ones here that it didn't work let's try something different and what i what you can do there it's things such as uh, look at the content they post do they partake if they're writing content themselves or commenting or contributing or sharing content? You can get a persona understanding of that individual and you then look to how do I engage with them? Because what I want to get really is a conversation down the line. How do I get that? And it might be as simple as liking their content. You know, if you're posting content about cloud computing or things that are relevant and authentic for me as Ian to like, I have every right to like it, right? You've posted it. Other people, you're unallowed to like your content. Like if it's authentic, again, if you're posting about architecture in the 17th century, me liking it is false. I'm lying to you by liking it, right? Because I've got an agenda. And if I ever speak to you, you go, oh, yeah, I saw you liked some of the content. What do you like about that, that architecture? I don't know. <laughs> so you've got to be authentic. But if you're posting about cloud computing and opinions about digital transformation, stuff that I genuinely comment on and speak about i can i can not only like your content i could add a comment i could add an authentic comment of you know um, I, I disagree nothing wrong with that i disagree with the opinion you had on that or like yeah but have you seen this content doesn't this uh, how do you feel about this and you end up sometimes getting conversations quite quickly don't then suddenly jump in with a sales pitch right because you've just blown it this is so the real world example of this for me is you go along to an event and people are mingling, getting their coffee in the morning and you bump into someone as you're getting the coffee and you make chit chat, right? You, you might say, how did, how did you get, what, what sessions, what are you here for today? You don't start off with, who do you work for? Um, oh, okay, what do you do there? Oh, okay, well, we do this. Let me try and sell to you. You'll just make chit chat, which is what you do on social selling. You're, make, you're doing that warm up piece authentically. Right. You're not going to make a lie to that person at the coffee thing. You say, How did you get? Oh, my gosh, I had a train journey. It was a nightmare. Oh, Christ, you should try the parking. Boom, boom, boom. Right. And then you might bump into them again during the day. Oh, how did you find the set? Which session did you go to? Oh, how did you? Oh, I went to this one. Really? Chit, chit, chit. You have another coffee or you bump into them at lunch and sit near them. At some point, at some point, the natural progression of that conversation is, well, well, Ian, what, what do you do? Like, what's your badge? One, one up. What, what, what do you guys do? Right. That's what happens on social. If you do it right, you like their content, you comment authentically like you would in person. At some point, the conversation, the, the electronic engagement moves to a place where it's natural that you might ask. They might say to you, um, we, can, we keep I've had it so many times where people have reached to me. I've had people invite me to connect. That's the beauty where a prospect that you want to engage with, you've engaged with. It feels like you know each other. They invite you to connect. I've had them where they've reached out and said, we keep we keep bumping into each other. I keep seeing your content, Ian. Um, I hope you don't mind connecting. It's a perfect invite to reply and say, absolutely no problem at all. And in fact, be great. Why don't we have a chat sometime? Right? And you end up with a conversation. And you don't jump in at the beginning, right, I want to sell you something. You have a conversation. And it naturally gives you the opportunity to say, by the way, while we're talking, uh, I, can I just ask a few questions? I'm curious whether whether there could be some opportunity to, and it's natural, and you're, you've got your conversation, but it takes time. 
that's the problem people don't like, right? Sometimes you'll get a lucky break and it's quick, but you've got to assume with social selling, it takes time. It's not as quick as picking up the phone, having a conversation. So don't try and shortcut it. That's what you described, right? Right there, Kate, is people shortcut it every time with reach out, invite a connection, and then send a sales pitch. And how often does that work? It doesn't. No, and it feels really awkward. And I think what you've mentioned, which really resonates, is around the authenticity. And it reminded me of, it must have been about eight years ago now, back when Foursquare was a thing. I don't know what's happened to Foursquare. It's certainly not a thing here in Australia anymore. Um, But I had connected with someone on Foursquare and I was going to San Francisco and it turned out he was the head of innovation for Cisco. Now, I could never have connected with him in a million years had I tried to ring and could I, and here it was because of an authentic, genuine connection because we were interested in something similar that completely cut through all of that that red tape. And I think, you know, what you speak about being authentic about who you are, what you represent, naturally starts some of those conversations and can bypass a lot of those traditional gatekeepers that might be there. And it works. I've got a story after, but it sometimes it won't work like everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Ian, we always finish up, and I think it's a good question um, for you, but we always finish up by asking what's something you wish people would do differently? So in the case of personal branding, what are some of the mistakes that people make or what are some things you wish people would do differently when it comes to their personal branding? Yeah, some real simple ones. This is the frightening thing. It is for, I'll give you a couple of quick nuggets. One is care about it, recognize what it is, that it's not for celebrities. You all have a personal brand, whether you label it that way or not, it's what others perception of yourself. And in today's world, that extends further, as we've said, with social. If you have social profiles, if you've got them, why, not, why don't you care about them? Like you created them. You took the uh, at some point you created a login, you put your details in. Well, nurture them. You know, you buy a plant and you stick it on your desk. If you don't water it or do something with it, it dies. Um, you need to water in, in effect, you need to nurture, not every five minutes, but go and look at your social profile right now, go and take a look. When did you last update it? Like when did you last update your photo? The number of people you look at and their photo is 20 years old, right? You meet them and go, there's no way that, particularly now on video and you get them on video and you go, you double take and go back and check the profile, right? Is that the, I've got the wrong profile. Had a rough week. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, be, be authentic uh, in doing it and make it personable. I mean, I'm always tuning the profile based on what I see other people doing. I'm plagiarizing all the time because there's no copyright on, on the approach you take. If you have a look at mine, for example, my about section talks of, I think it starts something like, without looking, um, and I, I first got into computing at age 14 when a neighbor, it's a story, it, it's readable. It isn't just fact, 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 you know, and all of the social platforms give you a lot of ability to stand out and really shine. LinkedIn has just added, if you look at my profile, and I think they've rolled it globally now, but if you look at it and the, the photo after a second or two will turn into a video. And if you click in on it, you've then got a short 30 second video because they've just added that functionality for free. Why wouldn't I use it? It's for free. It doesn't It takes you third, just do a quick video, boom, make use of what's there because it's free. Like there's so much provided by these platforms. Why would you not use it? Why would you not get references from customers at the bottom of your LinkedIn profile or Instagram or all of the different profiles, whichever. So, you know, I've referred to LinkedIn because B2B is sort of where I sit and that's the main sort of area with Twitter. But whether it's Facebook or Instagram, I'm on all of them. So I understand the platforms Um, where your audience is Firstly, choose the social platform that is where your audience is. Don't don't be on all of them for the sake of it. Where is your tribe? Where is your audience? And be on that platform. So if you're a designer, furniture maker or artist, Instagram is probably a good place because you've got a visual product. If you you sell bolts and widgets, who cares what they look like? Your customers are not on Instagram looking at that, right? So be where your audience is and then do it well. On that platform, figure out What can you do on that platform, whether it be Instagram stories or whatever, do make use of the platform and all its capability 
for free. Too often people just create a blank generic pro profile, don't care about the profile picture, don't care about the content they provide and never take part. They just created it a few years ago and it sits there thinking that, well, that, that's good enough, I'm on there. That doesn't engage your audience and it doesn't give them value and it therefore you won't get the value back. Absolutely. And so no TikTok videos for you, Ian? I'm on, weirdly, I'm on TikTok, so I understand the profile. And, and I'm on um, Foursquare. And, and, and you're right, it's sort of vanished. But any new social platform that appears, and there's a new one appeared that I've experimented, I'm just going to look up the name, called Thrive, F-R-I-V-E. Anything that appears, A, often, some or sometimes, the platform reaches out to me because of the nature of what I do. Uh, and I, I get invited to be an early beta and all the rest of it, which is great. Um, but I like to be on those platforms so I understand what's out there. So, you know, in G Germany, for example, their LinkedIn equivalent is, is called, um, my brain's gone now, uh, called Zing, X X I N G. I'm on there. But so that I, un the reason I do it is because I've fallen into this personal brand, social influence type stuff. I feel I have responsibility to it and talking to it and talking to you to, uh, to make sure I understand not just I'm LinkedIn blinkered. Too many, I think, social media experts that I, I hear look at what they do, all they talk about is LinkedIn. Well, that doesn't apply to every business and every audience out there, right? So I'm on Insta I'm on as many platforms as I can be. And the, the, the ones I mostly engage on are, are, are the, I, I'd say, probably the, the four most common are Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. But if you don't engage and take part, you don't understand. And how could I therefore speak about it with any authenticity as we were talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Ian, for being with me today on the podcast. Um, I think there's some fantastic gems in there around how people think about selling and how it relates to social media. Because if you don't understand that, you can get a lot wrong and waste a lot of time on, on social media. Um, so thank you so much for being with me today. Where can people connect with you? Where would you most like to see them? Sure, Kate, and thank you for that. And that in itself will give you another, uh, I guess, another nugget of a tip. So you can find me at ianmoist.co.uk and ianmoist.cloud, and that will take you directly into my LinkedIn and Twitter account. I've done the same. I won't read them all out, but on all my main accounts, I've, I've masked them with my own URLs so that my name's pretty easy to find. But imagine you were called Paul Smith. Okay, go on LinkedIn and search Paul Smith. Good luck. Now you've got to know the company. I, my view is make it easy for the audience to find you in, 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 as, in as few clicks as possible. So I, I, that was a, something I came up with a number of years ago because owning your own domain, and, and unless your name's Coca-Cola by accident, right? And owning your own domain costs virtually nothing. It, you know, my domains cost a few dollars a year to, to renew automatically. And I just pointed them I haven't had to set any website up. I just point them at my social profiles. So there you go. Go to earmoist.co.uk and earmoist.cloud. I remember being at a branding uh, workshop many years ago and the guy at the front of the room said, you've got 24 hours to go and buy your own URL or I'm going to buy them and sell them back to you in a few years. <laughs> and he said, I've got the list of all of your names. I'm going to go buy your URLs and sell them back to you when you, when you want to have a brand. So I thought that was quite comical <laughs> well, we will include to that, to that point i bought i bought my son and daughter's urls because they're so cheap i've got them so i've already bought them so oh, that's a great a idea <laughs> yeah so it's quite a few years but what i've done is bought them and then just redirected them to myself at the moment and at some point you know that, that there's their 16th birthday present if you want if if they want to go on tiktok when they're old enough or so there you go and i can give you a url as a present yeah, <laughs> that's a great idea. I'm going to go do that today. <laughs> so thank you so much, Ian. We'll include all of your links you. in the show notes. And it's been really great speaking with you today. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the Social Lights podcast produced by Social Mediology. You can connect with us on Facebook at Social Lights Podcast and you can find today's show notes and more episodes at socialmediology.com.au forward slash social lights. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast platform to receive future episodes and share with your tribe to inspire others to action.